This is the biggest one yet. This is the biggest one yet. Well, you don't do it very often. And, uh, <laughs> no, you know, it's, you're one of those artists and I respect that it. it took me a long time to respect that, that my time is not necessarily your time and that what I want to do doesn't always fit into the psychology of the artist. And that speaking about music is often kind of a redundant place to begin. But for now we get to talk about music and we get to talk about, you know, your journey, which like, we're still here, bro. And, um, and it's not lost on me that we're still here and, and it must, it must get even more sweet for you uh less bitter more sweet the, the the longer you're able to continue to create and and just trust your inner voice well as you know with toby you know falling by the wayside and then just looking around at the amount of people who've who we've lost you know over the last couple of years i mean but um but with toby it's, it's way before time and um you know that that that's uh, that's always in the back of my mind. You know, sometimes there's there's always that thing where you think because uh, the number's still on my phone. It happens to me as well. And the messages are still there, and so it, it takes a while to compute. And then you watch an old video, you know, and then like I was watching the emergency on planet Earth, um, you know, that sort of re 4K thing. And I'm just looking and just going, I mean, A, <laughs> A how young we all were, <laughs> you know, I mean, I look about 12. <laughs> and um, it's devastating, you know, to, to, uh, yeah. to see somebody go like that. But, you know, the good news with that is that um, Stasi, his daughter, is doing some really great stuff, really good. And she's, uh, and Dylan, his son as well. So they have certainly taken on the mantle of what he was doing. And, you know, when I look at them, I just see little Tobies or, well, getting bigger Tobies. That's beautiful, know. man. That's, yeah. That is, you're right. That is, um, that, that, that is the positive energy out of, out of something that doesn't seem fair. And, and it takes a long time to figure out what it all means. And that's a bridge that no one ever gets used to crossing. And I think, um, I think it also really, it really makes me think about the indestructibility of youth. And the idea of of you and your friends coming out and forming this band, and it's like, all right, our influences are authentic. Like we're in the acid jazz vibe. Like that's our label. We're just we're just trying to we're just trying to like impress the people that impress us. Yeah. When you found <laughs> the, what what you wanted to do, and I touched on this at the beginning of the conversation, it it was to me, I felt like you were trying to appeal to a small room of discerning fans, and I don't know whether it was timing. Certainly, you have to factor the quality of the music in. You, the marketing side of things, you like, like you said, you already had the Buffalo Man. Everything was kind of there. You had the, you know, the silhouette was there, and so, and silhouettes are really important. If you can sell it on a silhouette, you've smashed it, right? Yeah. So it, was, it was all there, and then out of nowhere, this kind of album starts to really pick up beyond that room, and you find yourself in bigger rooms. And and kind of you said it, it happened so fast. Like, how did that affect you looking back on it now? So psychologically and, and spiritually, knowing that what you were doing with, with, at an appropriate level was becoming inappropriately successful. Well, I mean, you know, the thing was a, a very spiritual thing for me. You know, I was, I was really deep into and and still is, you know. I mean, um, I was really deep into it. I wanted, I wanted to do anything that wasn't, um, you know, like a Stock Aiken Waterman type thing, you know, like tinny pop. And I remember actually going into Roundhouse Studios for the first time to do When You're Gonna Learn. And they put me in with um, the, the, the um, Errol, the drummer from, from Imagination. No, I like Imagination, so don't get me wrong here. But, um, but we were in there, crikey, it must have been in there for two days, day and night. And we got the track down, and it, or it had the full lyrics. Yeah, yeah, have you heard the news today? People ran across the world, and then we had the whole thing. And then there was a whole discussion about chopping all of it out. And I was doing everything I could to keep the drums raw and everything kind of quite lo-fi on the whole thing. Um, you know, down to the influences and the, the people that I liked, that I had. You know, I, 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 uh, you know, I had a a good musical education in that department, you know, 15, 16, I wasn't listening to the charts. I was listening to Pleasure, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, uh, uh, James Mason, and that, that was James Brown, and, you know, that was my thing, you know. And, uh, and I remember them trying to wipe out the lyrics, you know, wipe out. You're going to have to take half of these lyrics out 
I said, how, how can I take half of the lyrics? I don't get what you're trying to say to me. It's like, this is the song. That's it. Anyway, in the end, I, and, and, and of course, I, I was staggering, you know, to stay awake because I was so scared. If I drop or go out the room or go home. It's going to get pressed. They're going to screw this track up. They're going to press it up. I came back, I came back in the morning and, uh, and I mean, it was just, it, 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 it just been destroyed, the track. It, it just sounded like some kind of, you know, hi-fi, really bad, bad early 90s pop. And I was just furious. I threw it all out, threw everybody out, take it back to where it was, you know. Yeah, rightfully so. I have found the whole thing a bit of a battle. And, and you know, I also, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that, that the music that we do has not been a mainstream thing. And I haven't, I've probably not, I've probably been, you know, a more difficult custom, customer when it comes to the thing of people saying, hey, you know, um, you know, why didn't you do this? And I've been very strict on what I want to do. I want to do it this way. So, so in the height of your success, you know, and, and, you know, when it was the first time around, when in the first few albums and stuff, and it's all TFI Friday and Top of the Pops and Matt, um, you know, the, the reputation that was kicking around when I was just starting out in the UK was, you know, JK is difficult. And you've acknowledged that in this conversation that you had a reputation of being a bit of a difficult customer. So at that time, right, back then there wasn't social media and you couldn't be difficult today and nice tomorrow. That reputation really sticks. On a, on a very human level, how was it for you trying to do the best you can to make the best music and be true to your art, but kind of having this sort of early to mid 90s tabloid reputation for being a bit, a bit of an. I think, you know, you and I both know that, that um, and particularly in light of stuff that's come out with the hacking and stuff, which is, you know, um, you know, which we won't talk about in regards to me. Um, but, you know, that was um, virulent, you know, in the in the 90s. And um, not only did it involve, you know, photographers, and it went much further than that into the realms of the police and everything else. It was quite a, a full-on thing. You know, they were breaking the law um, um, on every single level. And, and it was a bit like, not necessarily even on my side, it was almost like, you know, you'd read the paper, you know, some poor guy. You think, this poor guy, you know, he's... You know, just an ordinary member of the public, and you you know read the words. It it took me a long time, and um, because uh, it took me a long time to go. You know, when I was a kid, you know, twenty two. You know, and I go, oh, but, but I didn't say that. <laughs> you know, it took me a long time to work out. They didn't give a shit whether you said that or not. That's just been construed. You know. So how do you get on that list? I think I think the invasive part was, you know getting followed around, you know, people in glazing vans, you know, fake glazing vans, um, you know, when you're trying to sit and just have a meal and you, you know, became an expert at spying. I said, there's nine guys at the moment waiting for me to pick my nose. You know, nine guys wait, they see I've got a motorcycle helmet, but I'm stuck outside a bar with a bottle of wine and they're waiting for me to get back on that motorbike to go, he's drinking and driving. Paranoid. Just yeah, paranoid. I mean, you know, and, and I have to say, and then on top of that, you know, uh, I think, you know, there are a couple of incidents outside nightclubs and what have you, where all you really want to do is get to your car and go home. But frankly, you can't see because when you've got 40 photographers all flashing away at you, you're temporarily kind of blinded. And, um, and then, you know, in the end, yeah, I suppose the temper goes, you know, someone gets it in the chin. And um, and then and then you know and then I get arrested. <laughs> That's the joy of it. You weren't alone. There was probably I would say ten to fifteen artists that seemed out of step with that time. Didn't seem to court it. Didn't want it. But found themselves on the receiving end of it. I mean, we forget that Bjork was one of those people at one point, which is crazy to think about. Can now. I can I just say, Zane? You know, going back to that point. You know, uh, through all that, the one thing that did get me through was the people listening to the music. People would stop me in the street. Uh, you know, love that track, man. Blah, blah, love you. It's great. Think that's a great tune. And that is what gets you through it. That is the thing. It is the fans and the people out there that get you through it, 100%. So we, we were big, big fans of, of your band, even through the early success. We were like, nah, they're, they're real deal. In New Zealand, everyone was really big, big into Jamiroquai, you know that. But I remember seeing the video for Virtual Insanity, and I'm glad we've stopped here because of the fact that it's all over the internet again. Um, 
And I remember, and I remember thinking, oh, this is another thing. Like, this is now all of the elements that make Jamiroquai special to us as real music fans growing up, finding, digging for the same funk records and searching for those little hidden breaks. But, but JK has, he has gone for it. Like, that video is iconic. It's an iconic moment. That video was a huge part of that. It was a funny, it was a funny day uh, doing that video. Uh, you know, n not only, uh, uh, as, you, as you well know, Zane, you know, videos were vastly expensive in those days. Pre-internet, that was your play. Well, I just remember um, with uh, Jonathan Glazier, you know, sitting um, a couple of days before. You know, the original, I, I, I had an idea, which was, you know, moving travelators, moving along, moving travelators, which, as you can imagine, technically, I mean, imagine trying to rip a travelator out of Euston Station and stick them all on top of each other. It's not going to work. And he'd obviously mulled over this, mulled over this. And, and this is an example of when you really are working with somebody and you are clicking on the same level. And he phoned me up about one in the morning. I said, hello. I've got it. He said, I've got it. I've got it. I'm, I'm going to lock off a camera and we're going we're gonna to move a room around. And I was like, right, okay, uh, I get it. Ha, ha, how does it, ha, uh, all right, yeah, I, I'll pretend I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, okay, sure, see you in the morning, go for it. Anyway, turned up on set. And all I can hear is, north, quickly, south, slowly, north again, quickly. And I'm thinking, what is going on in here? And anyway... And there's a couple of sofas in the room. And I'm like, right. So, and it was straight into action, you know, whatever it was, seven in the morning, eight in the morning, you know, a bit of makeup, off you go. And uh, I remember standing in the middle of the room, okay, and song played back, you know, and I kind of sort of got into a sort of regular kind of, you know, slink about like I do, you know, <laughs> cat in the hat. It. And, um, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then he went, right, I want you to be here on this line, and over there on that line, there's next line. And I'm, like, I'm looking at the room and I'm going, well, you want me to sing this line here? How do I get there by the time I'm singing this line? Anyway, I said, let me look behind the camera and see what on earth you're talking about. And as soon as I looked behind the camera, I went, oh, I get it. I see what's going on here. And, uh, and from then on, uh, the magic happened. Apart from, I might add, the, there was only four shots that video. And just, um, I never quite understood the crow. What the f is the crow doing here? But anyway, <laughs> never mind. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing uh, was the, all the blood coming out the walls. Now, on the last shot, um, also, there was a continuity problem because I picked up the wrong fleece, um, which was a slightly lighter blue than the fleece oh, I'd used. Nightmare. <laughs> he hasn't got enough to figure out with this. Crow and his bleeding walls and his moving floors. Here you are showing the up. Point was, the point was, Zane, that, that, that once the walls started to bleed, that was f***ing it. You know, it was like, there's no, there's no mopping up the blood. Can we take that shot again? You're in and that's it. It's, uh, it was like, you know, one of those things where, uh, well, we're in for the penny and for the pound. Let's hope it works. But how did it, how did it uh, work? I mean, I, I'm sure it's been talked about before, but I've never heard the story. How does the floor move, not just front and back? I see how Junior Watanabe did it, but he, you went left, right, and almost circular. How it's done is that the, if you like, the sofas are, are screwed into the wall. So they go along with the wall. And at any given point, suddenly they're quickly unscrewed, and then the, the, the all four, the whole the whole room is on wheels. So as you unscrew the sofa, you know suddenly the sofa looks like it's moving, but it's not. It, the whole thing is is the room moving. And uh, every, you know, I still get asked this uh, just time and time again, and it's just hard to explain. It, it, it's it's the room that's moving, not the floor. And then, of course, I still don't get it. And this is what's amazing about this idea. I still can't get my head around it. You know what? You really know you've made it in this business when about six months later, you see an advert for DFS furniture and they're doing the same thing. <laughs> some couch, some brown couches moving around the room. <laughs> <laughs> you know when it ends 30% down, nothing to pay till December. You know you've made it there. Yeah, but yeah, here you are, um, you know, and you're finding a way to celebrate the legacy that you've hard earned and, and we've 
you know appreciate it all the way through um paying respects to these albums um and and giving us these these kind of beautiful anniversary editions and then you also i mean it's like we're only sort of four or five years on from the last album um which which saw you tour um i saw you on the side of a road at you know on the way to coachella when i went up there and just kind of like totally got inside your got inside your personal space you know the other great thing i mean um you know, and if I could shout him out, Tyler, the creator, you know, he came to both of it. And, you know, we've hung out a couple of times when he's been in London. What a wicked guy he is. You didn't know because I said to you, did you see what Tyler said? And you were just like, no. And I was like, look at this. And you were like, oh, that's cool. Tyler, also the Internet, who've got the Buffalo Man tattooed like on all of them. It's just like manic. And, um, and, um, and they, they told me that they did some. Uh, interview with um, uh, I don't know it was it was it was it was definitely I guess one of the music magazines that doesn't particularly favour me much you know and uh, and they went so uh, you know who's your influence and they went a Jamiroquai man all day long and and and, and she was like what and, and, <laughs> you're kidding what the Pratt and the Hat <laughs> and they were like don't you say that about him don't you say that about him yeah right yeah right <laughs> and, uh, yeah I mean Tyler w- wicked guy and we we sat down and. We listened to all sorts of stuff from punk, rock, jazz. I mean, everything. He really has got his head out there. You know, uh, he, he's a super guy. Uh, as is, I might add as well, is, um, uh, you know, another guy uh, who, who we will work. We just haven't got the chance to hook up yet. Is Thundercat. I mean, that is just, uh, that is so perfect. He is, you know, and, and uh, I mean, we're, we're literally, I've just had to, what I've done at home, is I've just, because we didn't use it on the last two albums, and I've reinstated, uh, uh, not only sort of, it's not a question of the, the expense even, it's the question of finding somebody who can get your SSL uh, E with a G series solid state logic um, desk back up and running again after the poor thing was under its cover, bless its heart. And I was thinking to myself, hold on a minute. You know, yeah, sure, you know, do the Pro Tools, that's great, in conjunction with, but, you know, um, Pro Tools, you know, featuring Mr. SSL, Mr. Solid State Logic, because it's just something so organic about it, you know? At one point, I was going to get rid of the desk, nobody uses them anymore. I remember somebody saying to me, yeah, you probably get about five grand for that, mate. No, 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 no. And I was like, you know what, that is an old... French, lovely desk. I don't want to get rid of it. No, and it's it's integral to the sound of, of, of what you make. I mean, that space is a part of what you do, and you just sacrifice space with technology. You do. Well, I mean, I think the space we got at home now, we've sort of rejigged up the studio. We're kind of, you know, sort of ready. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of wait. Well, you don't need to wait long for this in England, but I'm, uh, I mean, not, o- not only with everything that's going on here, but there's nothing left to do but go in the studio because, because it's crumbling to pieces over here. And, um, and uh, so we are going to get in there as the, the leaves start turning brown and the November winds come and you think, you know, I've had a great summer, let's get back in there and get our heads down and, and, and get this next uh, part of the journey back together. There are, you know, a lot of these people that I really, I really would like to work with. You know, I've got to a, a point now, you know, where I, I want to I wanna stretch out my hands and, um, uh, you know, and, and give myself over to somebody else. I mean, there's a, there's, um, there's a, there's a French band called uh, Le, Le, L'Imperatrice. Um, who are, I think, are absolutely fantastic. And, I'd, yeah, you know, I'd kill to do a thing with Dua one day, you know, because I just think we could make some magic one day, the kind of stuff that we do. It's kind of like it's pretty on the same kind of level. And, um, and I don't know whether you saw the other day, there's a guy from over here called Younger. Yeah. Did you see that thing he did when he smashed up? He smashed up Cosmic, Virtual, Loveful, smashed him into one thing? No, I haven't seen that. You've got to see it, man. He's just, but Jamiroquai, I love you. But you know what? I just, I just looked at it and I thought, Jesus, this guy's got it going on, you know? Look what you've achieved over a life lived, dude, and still so much to do. And I think about, I think about that success that comes out of nowhere. You can never quantify it when you're that young. It's wasted on the youth. And then you sort of fight your way back into something that is ultimately that you can kind of is tangible and quantifiable. And then you find yourself at this point in your life, I'm going to rattle it off for you just to make you feel good in a nice 
cold, wintry, dark <laughs> evening in London, <laughs> right? You've still got your hair. You're aging beautifully. You got your voice. You got your body. You got your wits about you. And you've got all these artists who love you, man. I mean, it's all there. I'm fairly battle scarred, to be fair. I'd be, I'd be lying if I didn't say, you know, up here in this little brain of mine has had a few battles of its own. Um, the last few couple of years haven't helped. I must say cooped up at home. Dude, the music will lead you, man. It will always be there for you. It will always guide you. You know what? You, you, you think to yourself that, that for whatever you, you know, whatever you've done, music, um, as, again, just, sorry to quote Bob Marley twice in one interview, but hit me with music, hit me with music now, you know. Mm -hmm, I do, bro. Think about music, when it hit, you feel no pain.